Hello everyone and thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and this video is called Style in Writing Actions. So I'm going to be focusing on making your writing active and making sure that your writing clearly demonstrates the actions, the activities that are going on. For those who are interested in some more information, the source of the material is a book called Style, Lessons in Clarity and Grace by Joseph Williams, and I'm uh, basically deriving the material of this presentation from the ninth edition of that book. So it's a very useful book. Feel free to check it out if you'd like more tips. First, let's talk about what we mean by good writing. Um, some very simple adjectives that we use might use to describe good writing or to characterize good writing is that we think of good writing as being clear, direct, and concise. So to complement that in terms of bad writing, we think of bad writing as writing that is unclear, that's indirect, uh, and rather than being concise, easy to understand, it's dense and it's abstract. We can sum this up by saying that good writing facilitates communication and understanding while bad writing makes communication difficult and impedes our understanding. Let's take a look at an example. Once upon a time, as a walk through the woods was taking place on the part of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf's jump out from behind a tree occurred, causing her fright. Let's compare that to this version. Once upon a time, Little Red Riding Hood was walking through the woods when the wolf jumped out from behind a tree and frightened her. So obviously the second one is better. You probably instinctively just identified the second one as a better sentence or a better written sentence. Why do we prefer it? For two primary reasons. One, we know what's actually happening. And two, we know who's doing it. We know who is acting. To put that in grammatical terms and the terms that we're gonna use in this presentation, the main characters of the story or of the sentence are the subjects of the verbs and the verbs that are used express specific and important actions. So let's talk about what this means more specifically. Let's step back and talk about some very basic issues in terms of grammar, the very basics of a sentence. Every sentence is going to have a subject and a verb, which we normally think of as the actor, the person doing the action or the thing doing the action, and the verb, the action being performed, the action that's happening. So very simply, John hit the ball. John is the subject, hit is the verb. Birds fly south for the winter. The birds are the subject, fly is the verb bring me a drink. Here, bring is the verb and the implied subject not stated explicitly is you. You bring me a drink. So these are all standard uh, sentences with a subject, in the last case implied, and a verb. Now in those last sentences that I just showed, the subject of the sentence and the character of the story were the same and the verb of the sentence and the character's actions were the same. However, these can be different. That is, the subject of a sentence, the grammatical subject, might not be the character, the person or thing, that you're actually intending to talk about in your sentence. Similarly, the, grammatic, the grammatical verb of the sentence might not be the actions that you're actually trying to depict because there's very many ways that you can shuffle around character and actions in a sentence and still make it a grammatically correct sentence. However, this often makes things rather unclear and confusing. One way in which the characters and actions can be switched around or moved around in a sentence is through what's called passive voice. And in passive voice, what happens, the main character, the actor of the action, is not the subject of the verb. So the actor is obscured. So we have a sentence like, the cake was eaten, the money was stolen, or as politicians love to say, mistakes were made. Well, who ate the cake? Who stole the money? Who made the mistakes? Right? So in those cases, the actor is obscured, is hidden. 
You can put the actor and the, the main character in a sentence using passive voice, but it becomes very awkward because it's put at the end as the indirect object of the verb. So the cake was eaten by raccoons. The money was stolen by my brother. Instead of the raccoons ate the cake, my brother stole the money. Another way that characters and actions can be shuffled around in a sentence is through the use of inactive or empty verbs. These are verbs that don't express important actions. They're often just extra words in a sentence. Uh, some of these are forms of the verb to be, is, am, are. So there is nothing that we can do. Her failure was the result of not studying for the test. In both of these, the actor is uh, unclear. Right, and the verb, the action is also unclear. What is it that, that is actually happening? Uh, is is not an active verb. Was is not an active verb. Similarly, we have phrases where there's an unnecessary or extra verb. He conducted an inquiry into the crime instead of he inquired about the crime. The lowering of taxes on the wealthy means that the middle and working class will have a heavier burden. So phrases um, here, means is a very empty verb. The actual actions of lowering taxes and having a burden or being burdened, those are hidden because of the empty, wasted verbs. So let's go back to our example. Once upon a time, as a walk through the woods was taking place on the part of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf's jump out from behind a tree occurred, causing her fright. Versus, once upon a time, Little Red Riding Hood was walking through the woods when the wolf jumped out from behind a tree and frightened her. So let's take a look at this sentence, uh, these two sentences, uh, section by section, and compare the matching, the, the complementary sections in each. So, as a walk through the woods was taking place on the part of Little, Riding, Little Red Riding Hood, uh, corresponds to Little Red Riding Hood was walking through the woods. So what's the action that's taking place in the first sentence? As a walk was taking place. And who's doing that walking? Who's the character that's doing the walking? It's Little Red Riding Hood. So instead of as a walk was taking place on the part of Little Red Riding Hood, a much more direct way of saying that is Little Red Riding Hood was walking. Right? So here, the verb and the action are the same, the character and the subject are the same in the second version. Whereas in the first version, the character and subject are different, Little Red Riding Hood versus walk, and the verbs are not actions. Or the verb is not the main action, it says was taking place when the action is actually the action of walking. Let's look at the second part of the sentence. The wolf's jump out from behind a tree occurred, causing her fright, versus when the wolf jumped out from behind a tree and frightened her. So the wolf's jump out from behind a tree occurred. What's the action that's happening and who's performing it? Who's the character that's performing it? Well, the jump is the action that occurs and the wolf is the one that's doing it. So rather than saying the wolf's jump occurred, which again, hides the action and hides the actor, we say, when the wolf jumped out from behind a tree. The wolf jumped out, much more direct. Finally, causing her fright versus frightened her. The jump caused her fright as opposed to the wolf frightened her, right? Obviously one is much more direct. So the action of frightening her is obscured by the verb causing, causing her fright. Um, and the actor is also obscured. It says the wolf's jump is what frightened her, um, but it's the wolf that frightened her, not the jump that frightened her. It's the wolf jumping. So the wolf frightened her, much more direct. So let's state this as our first two sort of principles of clarity and style. First principle is put the important actions in verbs. It's much easier to understand what's happening in your writing if the verbs you use are the actions that you're trying to demonstrate or show. So make sure that the verbs match up to the actions that are occurring. Second principle, Make the main characters, the people or things or ideas that you're talking about that are performing the actions, 
make sure that those are the subjects of the verbs. It's much easier to understand when we know who is doing what and what they are actually doing. I'll talk more about characters in a future presentation, but talk a little bit about it here, mostly going to focus on actions and making sure the important actions are verbs. Let's take a look at another example. The Federalists' argument in regard to the destabilization of government by popular democracy was based on their belief in the tendency of factions to further their self-interest at the expense of the common good. This is a very dense, confusing sentence. It's very hard to tell what's going on and who's doing it. So what do we, how do we diagnose? How do we figure out what's going on in this sentence and try to improve it? Well, first we ask ourselves, what's the subject, the grammatical subject? What's the grammatical verb? And do they match up with the main character or characters and the main action or actions? So the simple subject of the sentence as written is argument. The whole subject is the Federalist argument in regard to blah, blah, blah. The whole thing is, is part of the subject. But the symbol, the basic subject is just argument. And the main verb is was based. So the simplest way to write this sentence would just be say something like, or to, to boil down this sentence as it's written now is, the argument was based. Very simple, right? But not very clear. What does it mean to say the argument was based? That's not a real action. Who's basing the argument? Who's, who's doing the arguing? So the subject and main verb here are basically empty. Now let's look at the, the, the sentence again and identify who are the characters? Who are the people or things that are actually doing something um, that and we can identify as characters, as concrete beings in this sentence? Well, we have the Federalists, we have government, we have popular democracy, and we have factions. These are all the characters that are being talked about in this sentence. These are the characters that are doing something in this sentence or are having things done to them. And what are the actions? Well, here we want to look through the, the words, and, and as we'll see, many of the actions are put in what are called nominalizations. They're made into nouns. So argument, destabilization, belief, tendency to further, these are all the actions that are being performed because was based is not a real action, but argue, destabilize, believe, tend to further, these are all actions that are going on. So in this sentence, the subject does not match up with the characters. The verb does not match up with the actions. Now, let's line them up. Let's see who's doing what. And if we notice, not all the characters that we identified are, are, uh, are mentioned here. Um, government is not listed here because, as it turns out, government is not one of the actors in this story, in this sentence. That is, government is not actually doing anything. Government is being acted upon. So who are the characters that perform actions in this se sentence, and what are the actions that they're doing? Well, the Federalists are doing the arguing. Popular democracy is doing the destabilizing. They, which is again the Federalists, are believing, and what they believe is about factions tending to further their own interests. So the Federalists argued, popular democracy destabilized, they believed, Factions tended to further. So let's rewrite this sentence, making the characters into the subjects as far as we can and turning those uh, actions into the main verbs. The Federalists argued that popular democracy destabilized government because they believed that factions tended to further their self-interest at the expense of the common good much clearer here right we have clear actions we know who's saying we what we know what the federalists believe we know what they believe about popular democracy and its effects we know what they believe about factions and their effects so we know what's happening in this sentence and it's much clearer because it doesn't have all those abstractions and complicated phrases of the previous version
Now, let's talk about those words, argument, destabilization, words like that. Those are all functioning as nouns. So let's talk about the different types of nouns. We can think to basically divide nouns into two categories, abstract and concrete. Concrete nouns, as the term implies, concrete, what is concrete, right? It's a solid uh, building material. So a concrete noun is a noun. It's something that can be identified through the sentence, through the senses. So telephone, noise, John, Jim, Lisa, the park, the sun, salt, air, the wind, right? These are all concrete nouns. They're just things, things that we could see or touch or hear or a smell or taste. Right? They're identified through the senses. Abstract nouns, on the other hand, are things that cannot be identified through the senses. So usually concepts or ideas, courage, ugliness, education, ignorance, analysis, harassment. These are all things, they're all nouns, but we can't touch courage. We can't see education. We can't smell harassment. Right? These are not things that um, exist as uh, concrete objects in the physical world. A nominalization is a specific type of noun, and it's a uh, type of abstract noun. And that's when you take a verb or an adjective and you convert it into a noun. You make an action or a, or a description, an adjective, you make it into a thing. And what happens when you do this is you create these abstract nouns. So the verb discover creates the noun discovery. The verb resist creates the noun resistant, um, or excuse me, resistance. Uh, careless, the, the adjective careless becomes the noun carelessness. The verb react becomes reaction. The verb uh, uh, or the adjective different becomes difference. The adjective proficient becomes proficience. So you might describe someone as proficient, as different, as careless, or you could say they possess carelessness. They possess difference. They possess proficience. A gerund is another type of nominalization, and that's when a verb ending in ing is used as a noun. So for example, instead of saying we sang loudly, you might say our singing was loud. So here singing could be a verb, but it's functioning here as a noun. The singing is the thing that we're talking about. Or do you mind if I ask you a question versus do you mind my asking you a question? In the second example, asking has been turned into a noun, a thing. Do you mind the asking of this question? So this is another way in which abstract nouns can be constructed. Some nominalizations uh, are identical to their verbs. I hope we arrive on time. My hope is that we arrive on time. The verb and the noun form are the same. We request that you review the data. Request and review are both verbs. Our request is that you do a review of the data. Right? A grammatical sentence, awkward obviously, but in that case, the verbs just same form, but they function here as nouns. We request, our request is, you re review the data, you do a review of the data. So generally speaking, you want to avoid nominalizations in your writing when you can. They are abstract and they're very unclear. They're abstract nouns, so that makes them harder for your readers to grasp. And they obscure the action. They take the action that's occurring and they put it into a noun form. And often they obscure the main character or actor by becoming the subject of the sentence themselves. So nominalizations, um, generally speaking, you want to avoid them because doing so, uh, using them makes it hard to make your subjects and characters match up and your verbs and actions match up. All right, now that we've talked about some of the principles of stylish writing, more active writing, let's talk about how we can revise our own work to make it more active, make it more clear, make it more stylish. The first step is, of course, to diagnose the problem, to find the problems in your writing. So 
looking through a piece of your writing, looking at the sentences, the first step is to underline or highlight the first seven to eight words or so of each sentence, and you ignore any introductory phrases, so of the main clause. And what you're looking for here is looking for abstract nouns that serve as subjects, usually abstract nouns that are nominalizations, and also look for long delays before the verb. That is where you've got a lot of words, a lot of writing before you actually get to the main verb of the sentence. So here's an example of a sentence. The outsourcing of high-tech work to Asia by corporations means the loss of jobs for many American workers. So I've underlined the first few words as if this was a sentence that I was writing in, in my own paper. Now it's time to diagnose it and see what problems do we have. First off, we do find uh, an abstract noun, outsourcing. That's an abstract noun. It's a nominali nominalization of the verb to outsource. So we have, an, we have a, a, an abstract noun, a nominalization at the very beginning of the sentence, and it is here serving as the subject. Also, if we notice, where does the verb come in? Well, the main verb means, the outsourcing means the loss. It's 10 words before we actually get to it. That's a lot of time before the main verb. That makes it a lot harder to understand because your reader doesn't necessarily know what the action is, what's actually happening in the sentence. So we've identified two problems already in this sentence. It has an abstract noun at the beginning in the form of a, in the function of a subject, and it has 10 words until the main verb, which itself is also a rather empty, meaningless verb. So the next step is to analyze the sentence. Determine who your main characters are, who is it that you're actually talking about, identify the actions that the characters perform, and again, if, you're, if you've identified a, a nominalization or an abstract noun at the beginning in the form of subject, um, usually your characters and actions are not gonna line up with your subjects and verbs. So identify what the actions are that the characters are actually performing, and then match the characters to the action. So let's go back to that example. The outsourcing of high-tech work to Asia by corporations means the loss of jobs for many American workers. Well, who are the characters that we're talking about in this story? The corporations, one set of characters, and many American workers are the other set of characters. And what's the actions? What are the actions that are taking place? Well, one is outsourcing. That is an action that is taking place. Another action that's taking place is loss, the loss of jobs. So outsourcing or outsource, uh, lose the, or loss, the action is to lose. So outsourcing, outsource and lose are the two actions in the sentence. Matching up the characters to the actions, who does the outsourcing? The corporations do the outsourcing. Who does the losing? The many American workers do the losing. So now we know who is actually uh, uh, doing something in this story, who the characters are, who the real actors are, and now we know what they're actually doing, what actions they're performing. Now, in the final step, you rewrite. So any of those nominalizations that you've discovered, like outsourcing or loss, you turn them into verbs, you make the main characters into the subjects of the sentence, so the main characters being corporations and many American workers, and then you rewrite the sentence, and you'll probably need to use some sort of subordinating conjunction. That just means something that links two clauses, links one as subordinate to the other, with a word like because, if, when, although, why, how, etc. These are all the conjunctions that will link two different clauses and explain the relationship between them. So let's look at that um, rewritten version. Now we've converted the nominalizations of outsourcing and loss to active verbs. We've made the characters, corporations, and workers into the subjects, and this is what we have. Many American workers are losing their jobs because corporations are outsourcing their high-tech work to Asia. Now, as a just a note here, these verbs are still ending in ing, 
but are losing, are outsourcing, those are act, those are functioning as verbs. They're not functioning as nouns. Um, the outsourcing of high tech work, that's outsourcing used as a noun. Corporations are outsourcing, outsourcing used as a verb. So now in this rewritten version, characters line up with subjects, actions line up with verbs. Now let's look at some common patterns. These are typical ways in which nominalizations will appear in writing and uh, ways in which abstract nouns, nominalizations um, can obscure the action and obscure the actors, the characters. So one common pattern is when the nominalization forms the subject, becomes the subject of the sentence, and the verb is an empty verb like be, seems, has, etc. So in this example, the intention of the committee is to audit the records. Intention is a nominalization of the word of the verb intend, and, and here it's functioning as the subject, whereas the verb of this sentence is is an empty verb, doesn't tell us anything. The intention is. So when we have a nominalization or pattern like this, what do we do to improve the sentence? First, change the nominalization to a verb. So intention becomes intends. Find the character that performs that action. Who is doing this intending? It's the committee. The committee is doing the intending. Now rewrite the sentence, making the character the subject, the new verb, the verb. The committee intends to audit the records. Much more direct, much clearer. Now we know who is doing what. And it's not focused on the intention is to, but the committee intends to. Much clearer version. Another common pattern where a nominalization follows an empty verb. That is a verb that is an action. It's not to be or something like that, but it doesn't really tell us anything. So here's the example. The agency conducted an investigation into the matter. So here investigation is the abstract noun and the empty verb is conducted, the agency conducted. Well, to conduct something, unless you're talking about conducting a symphony orchestra, it's kind of a, an empty verb, doesn't really tell us, it's not an action that we can picture. So here, again, the process is fairly simple. Change the nominalization to a verb, investigation becomes investigate, and just replace the empty verb with a new verb. The agency investigated the matter. Much more concise, much more direct than the agency conducted an investigation. Conducting an investigation is a vague, empty sort of phrase, whereas investigated is much more active and direct. A third common pattern where we have two different nominalizations in the sentence. Uh, this is essentially a combination of those first two that we saw. One nominalization is the subject of an empty verb. The second follows an empty verb. So as an example, our loss in sales was a result of their expansion of outlets. Loss and expansion are our two uh, abstract nouns, our two verbs turned into nouns. And the empty verb here in the center is was. The loss was. So a meaningless empty verb. How would we improve this? Well, once more, revise the nominalizations into verbs. Loss becomes lose. Expansion becomes expand. Identify the characters who perform those actions. Who is losing it? Well, it's our loss and their expansion. So if those are now the, the characters of the new verbs, it's we lose and they expand. And finally, we link the new clauses with a logical connection that explains how they're related. We lost sales because they expanded outlets, right? Now it says clearly what happened, we lost sales, and it states clearly what action caused that loss in sales, they expanded outlets. Another pattern where a nominalization 
follows there is or there are. So for example, a sentence like, there is no need for our further study of this problem. Here we actually have two nominalizations, need and study, both of which are in that category of verbs that have the same form, whether they're verbs or nouns. So let's look at how we would improve this pattern, this kind of pattern. Again, as always, change the nominalizations to verbs. Need is just need, study is just study. Identify the characters that perform the actions. Um, it's we, we are the, it's our further study. And it's also we are the people who need or don't need to study. So making the character the subject of the verb, we have we need not study this problem further. Instead of there is no need, we need not study. Or if that phrasing seems a little awkward, uh, we do not need to study this problem further. And both of those versions are appropriate, both of those are direct, much more clear, and they eliminate the awkward and empty there is phrase. Finally, uh, a pattern where we have two or three nominalizations in a row joined by multiple prepositions. So we did a review of the evolution of the brain. Two nominalizations here, review and evolution, and they're joined by the preposition of, of the, the uh, ev review of the evolution of the brain. So what do we do when we have two or three nominalizations joined by prepositions? So we first turn the first nominalization into a verb. And in this case, review just becomes review. It stays the same. And now we have an option. We can either leave the second nominalization as is, or we can convert it to a verb in a clause that begins with how or why. So instead of we, can, we did a review of the evolution of the brain, we reviewed the evolution of the brain, or we reviewed how the brain evolved. Either of those are appropriate. Both of those are pretty clear. The second one is the most active because it has no nominalizations, only verbs, but either one would be fine and either one is better than the original example. Now, finally, there are times when you want to use nominalizations. It can be a useful uh, technique, a, a useful tactic. Obviously, if it's something that happens in the English language, it can't be something that we should never do. It wouldn't even be an option. It wouldn't even be something that we could do with our language if it was always wrong. So there are times when nominalizations can be quite useful. One example is when they're used as a short subject to refer to a previous sentence. So these arguments all depend on a single unproven claim. This decision can lead to positive outcomes. In both of these cases, the, set, the nominalization links one sentence to the next. These arguments, this decision, are referring to something that was talked about in the previous sentence. The arguments that were just mentioned, the people arguing the decision that someone made in the previous sentence. So here it's useful because it connects the sentences. Another example of a, when nominalization can be useful is to replace the phrase, the fact that. So for example, the fact that she acknowledged the problem impressed me. You could use, uh, to, if you wanted to avoid the fact that, because it's somewhat of an empty phrase, it's kind of just meaningless extra words, you could say her acknowledgement of the problem impressed me. Or her acknowledging the problem impressed me. Those would both be uh, preferable, generally speaking, to using the fact that. But we could even improve it one step further. She impressed me when she acknowledged the problem. Now you eliminate the whole uh, issue of nominalizations and abstract nouns altogether. But even still, the second version here, the middle sentence here, uh, is an improvement over the first in most people's eyes. A nomalization can also be useful um, as the object of a verb. So if someone has requested something, you say, I accepted what she requested. Sounds a little awkward. Instead of the verb she requested, 
we could turn that into the nominalization, the noun request. I accepted her request. Another way, another example would be, I answered what she was asking. I answered her question. So here, the nominalization makes the sentence, unlike what it normally does, it actually makes it a little bit more concise and direct. An anomalization that refers to a concept so familiar that functions as a virtual character. This is a concept that, that your audience will be very familiar with, so you don't need to, uh, you, you can use it as a noun. So for example, few problems have divided opinion as much as abortion. In that case, abortion, since it is a, a concept, a concept that people know that they're familiar with, you can use the nominalization. The Equal Rights Amendment was an issue in past elections. Amendment and elections, both uh, ideas, concepts that are very familiar to us, so we it, they don't really obscure any actions. And again, taxation without representation did not spark the American Revolution. So three nominalizations, all useful because they're identifying concepts that work as um, characters in their own right. So to review, the most important thing to remember is that the subject and the verb of a sentence, which are grammatical parts of a sentence and they are fixed in a certain order, uh, we always have subject then verb, those can be different from the characters and the actions. The characters and the actions are not, the gr are not grammatical, they're not part of the grammar of the sentence, they're part of the information or the ideas or the story that you're communicating. So characters and actions can be split from the subjects and verbs, but sentences are more clear, writing is more clear and stylish when subjects line up with characters, verbs line up with actions. So express the important actions that, that you're trying to show that are taking place in your story or your, your essay, express those in verbs. Make sure that the main characters of your story, the things or people that you're talking about, the things that are performing those actions are also the grammatical subjects of the verbs. And finally, avoid nominalizations, avoid abstract nouns, except in certain cases where it might be useful. Of course, as with anything in terms of style, it's always going to be up to you as the writer to determine what you think is best. Uh, but these are some principles that are very useful, very helpful for making your writing more active, more clear, more direct. So if you have any questions, of course, you know how to get in touch with me. Uh, I will see you in the next presentation. Have a great day.